Welcome to the inaugural Neville Guilfoy talk on the future of entrepreneurship and innovation. Let's set the stage by acknowledging that we're at Dalhousie University, which is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We're all treaty people. I know that some of Neville's family and friends are here in the audience, and I understand that some of you have donned a bow tie in his honor, so a very special welcome to you. Let me turn it over to Don and Jim Mills, both of who are our MBA alumni, to give the formal opening to today's event. You'll notice that while we're all used to technology, there's still some glitches even in, in, even in kind of platforms like this where we've had some practice. So don't be alarmed if you have to turn up your volume a little bit to be able to hear them. Uh, Jim and I are very pleased to welcome you to the first Neville Guilfoy talk and uh, I hope that you'll enjoy this session and uh, we know that Neville will be watching down today uh, uh, to see what happens. Yeah Don and I are uh, we're really excited that the Neville Guilfoy talk is uh, finally launching it's been a it's been a bit of a journey to get here uh, we're very pleased about that uh, Neville was the entrepreneur's entrepreneur is how I would put it and you know he did so much for uh, for the business community uh, during his lifetime. Uh, obviously, he was the publisher of uh, Progress, a uh, very successful magazine for many many years in this region. Uh, he was the uh, creator of the top 101 companies uh, and the face-to-face -face conferences that he uh, pr you know promoted to help uh, networking in the region um, and. And really, his focus was not just on Nova Scotia, it was all of Atlantic Canada, something that uh, we shared with him, uh, the interest in, in, in the region overall. Yes, you know, Neville really believed that growing the private sector was the key to growing wealth uh, for Atlantic Canada, and he uh, obviously was uh, so correct uh, in that regard. Um, he's a guy that was always had ideas. He was... He was the nonstop idea generator, is uh, how I would put it. And every time you bumped into Neville, uh, he was positive, energetic, and he'd, he'd be bouncing the latest thing that was uh, uh, on his mind in terms of what we could do next, what he could do next, uh, and so on. He's, he, was, he was really quite a guy. And just on a personal note, uh, Neville was such a great guy to be around. Uh, at times irreverent, <laughs> but but always funny, and uh, and just a great person to hang out with. Uh, you know, we we miss him. We we miss him as a as a friend, and I and it's one of the reasons that we wanted to do something to keep his memory alive, uh, and to uh, celebrate his life. So uh, we're hopeful that uh, uh, this talk and the bursaries that come out of the funds that we help raise will will keep his memory alive. No question. Neville would be so thrilled to know that uh, through this uh, uh, fund that's been created in his name, uh, students will uh, receive bursaries. Uh, the Neville Guilfoy talk will become an annual event. Uh, it will grow in magnitude, uh, undoubtedly, and uh, you know to match his magnanimous personality. So just to conclude, uh, we hope that you enjoyed the first uh, Neville Guilfoy talk and uh, we'll return each year uh, to this uh, uh, innovative way of uh, keeping him in our memory. Have a great day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, John and, and uh, Jim, that was great. It's nice to get that kind of personal opening, I think, for the session today. And now I'm gonna introduce you to each of the panelists. Let me start by asking Tom to tell you a bit about himself. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Tom Hickey. Um, <clears throat> I'm originally from Glace Bay, uh, graduated from Dalhousie Engineering a few years ago, many more than a few. Um, <laughs> I had the benefit of uh, going to the face-to-face -face conferences, and we'll talk about that a little, but it was a big help to me in my first few years in business. I guess if, uh, to define myself, I'd say I'm the startup guy. I've done 23 startups since I've left university. Uh, I've ranged in business from um, safety, which was my first one. I sold that in 2012 and ended up uh, with 26 locations across North America and about 900 employees. 
But from there, I uh, was into road construction and still am, uh, land development, refrigeration, medical clinics. Um, the list goes on. The only thing I'm uh, addicted to, I think, is variety <laughs> in my business. Um, anyway, that's a little about me. It's really happy to be here. And I think if it was done a little later in the day in honor of Neville, I would have had a martini to cheers things off. But uh, it's a little early for that. Thanks, Tom. Let me ask Matthew to come and say a few things about himself. Thanks so much, Kim. Hi, everyone. Matthew Martell. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the BBI. Uh, I'm also a Dell Housing Management alumni and, and currently sit on the, uh, the Faculty's Advisory Board, which, which has been a wonderful experience so far. Uh, I'm extremely passionate about entrepreneurship, particularly uh, entrepreneurship as it pertains to underrepresented founders. Uh, and some of the work that we do through the BBI is really where we're shifting the economic needle in the black community through training, mentorship, uh, entrepreneurial services, and really we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. And, and we're really just continuing to uh, scratch the surface and, and make significant impact in the community. So hearing Tom's, uh, you know, stories uh, about, um, about Neville is great. And even since being asked to do this talk, I've heard so many great stories that, that I feel uh, disadvantaged to have not had the opportunity to meet him. Um, you know, but I, I have a, a strong feeling that through today, I'm going to hear even more stories about the things that he's done and the lives that he's touched. Uh, so I, I feel extremely grateful to be able to be a part of this today. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. I feel like we're in the same boat. So I will be, we'll be educated today together. Julia, why don't you come and say a few things about yourself? Hi, Kim. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Dalhousie and Jim and Dawn and, and Neville's family for, for offering this stage to, to talk about innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, I came to Nova Scotia because I was told this is where you need to be to be the best. <laughs> so I was a come from away, um, came for the sport of canoe kayak. And after retiring at the age of you know 24, <laughs> I, I decided that I would go into business and really it was brand new. I had no experience, no connections. And it's funny because Neville was there from the beginning for me. And it's, it's really incredible when you're given a hand up early on. And so I'm so thrilled to be here today to, to talk a little bit about that. So I, um, I've owned and operated four tech startups. Uh, currently I'm the CEO and co-founder of iRead. So we deliver <clears throat> literacy education through video games kids love. And we're used in 160 countries um, by over 3 million students. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. Amazing. Cool. Thanks, Julia. All right, Dennis. Kim, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dennis Campbell, and I'm really, really thrilled and delighted and honored to be here today uh, to uh, take part in honoring Neville and perhaps maybe giving some other entrepreneurs some ideas. Um, you know, um, you're going to see a few little teasers that I'm not really going to speak too much about right now. Uh, I'll, I'll refer to them later on in the Q&A if time permits. But, you know, I, I show the, uh, the, the power of persistence because Neville was big on uh, persistence. Um, and he taught me a lot about it. I thought I knew a lot. He taught me a lot more about it and how effective it was. Um, also, Neville was always after me to wear my kilt. Uh, we were the company with the kilts. We are the company with the kilts. Uh, but every time I didn't have my kilt, Neville was always, where the heck is your kilt? Or actually, where the hell's your kilt? Um, you know, but uh, uh, I want to tell you one quick little story about Neville that was really, truly transformational in my life. Um, Neville, he was he had such a unique and uncanny way of connecting and, and, and developing friendships and with, with customers that became lifelong friends. And for me, uh, one day, he knew I was very frustrated in, in business. Um, I was running the company for, you know, since I started it uh, at that point, 20 years previous, when I started in high school, uh, the company was growing like mad. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was not very good at running the company. I, was, I, I came to realize I was very good at building a company, but I was not very good at ever really making any money with the company. Um, and Neville knew this. And, and Neville said to me one day, I'd like to have a meeting with you and your business partners. And my two business partners at the time, who were great guys, were, they're still dear friends today. We sat down in our boardroom with Neville and Neville said, guys, he put his arms out on the boardroom table. We thought he was gonna sell us 
some, some more advertising. Uh, and, and he put his hands on the table and he said, fellas, which one or two of you knuckleheads is leaving and which knucklehead is staying? And we all were shocked. And we, we, we said, what are you talking about? And he said, this business can't run the way it's running. You guys need a real operator. Uh, you got to figure this out. And I, literally within a few seconds, I put my hand up and I said, I'll go because I was just exhausted. And Neville, my partners looked at me and said, you can't go. We're 10 and 15 years older than you. You're the young guy. You need to stay. And this, the discussion went on. And by the time Neville left the room, we had a very amicable uh, back of the napkin sort of deal for me to buy my partners out over time. And, you know, Neville had a smirk on his face walking out of the room and said, Denny, he said, you're not going anywhere. You're just going to grow this business. And it, it, it was transformational in my life. And that's just one example of what Neville did for me because it was life changing. And I, I owe him so much and, and I miss him dearly. Awesome. That's a great introduction and what a neat way to set the scene for the rest of the conversation we're about to have. So you'll see that the rest of the panelists are coming back to join me. Let me start by lobbing you out a first question and I'll ask anyone who wants to jump in on it to do so. Um, you know, it's clear from the introductions that you've offered that Neville was an innovative person and an amazing mentor. Um, maybe I'd ask you to tell us a little bit about the importance of innovation uh, in kind of an entrepreneurial activities and, and if you like a little bit about some of the important drivers of innovation focused businesses. I can take that, Kim, just to Thanks, Julia. <laughs> um, I've thought a lot about this question um, and there's so many things that make a successful innovative business. A lot of things have to go right, but I think two two main things that, that I think Neville actually reflected really, really well. One is being really bold, being being globally minded about what you can do. And he always looked at Atlantic Canada as being a pocket of real excellence, whether he was talking about oceans or innovation or, or whatever it was. Um, and so I think that boldness is really important to get out of pocket um, and to work with people who are the best in the world and to bring that back home and to, to help lift um, our our environment of business so that, that was one thing and then obviously connections you know he was the king at building relationships and relationships have proven to be kind of ultimately the reason I've been able to see any success and so I really uh, I think that those two things are good good things to bring up just because I think Neville represented them so much what about you Tom um really interesting question uh and I thought about the question a lot too, so I'm going to start early and end up late. Uh, my first business was safety, and we were offshore oil and gas safety. And we'd invested a ton of money, more than I had, um, so thanks to the banks at that point, um, in growing the offshore industry for ourselves to find out that they didn't hit any more gas offshore Nova Scotia. So with respect to innovation, we hired a bunch of MBA students. We did market research around the world to see where the fastest growing offshore uh, oil and gas markets were. And within probably 18 months, we set up an office in Brazil, signed a contract with uh, Petrobras and worked there for five years. So that's the type of creative innovation. And I guess to fast forward to today, I love all the tech industries that are out there. I play a little bit in the space, but I'm sure not an expert there. But I've got a refrigeration business. I've got a road construction business. And what we've tried to do there is add tech into what I'd call old business. So the innovation now, we're, we're, we've gone paperless. So all of our meetings, all of our uh, inspections, everything is done now wirelessly with some pain, but that's innovation in old industries new. So just two examples of kind of how to tie innovation in with, uh, with some old school businesses too. And I think there's big opportunities there. Thanks, Tom. I always like to hear we hired some MBA students. You know what I mean? Better if you have <laughs> Dal in front of MBA students, but still. <laughs> How about I turn it to you, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So, so again, not uh, not having uh, met Neville, I, I get the feeling and, and the vibe that, um, you know, a pandemic like this, just ripe with opportunity, would have been, you know, a really um, great time to have a mentor like him to uh, help guide startups. But in the, in the work that we do with BBI, we've seen a lot of um, 
innovative companies just make some really strong pivots here through the pandemic, uh, including Smooth Meal Prep and Vanity Fashion, to name a couple. Um, and and really, I I think that's what it's about is you know no one's ever really going to know um, you know what's next or, or what's on the horizon, but it's just important to remain agile as a business um, and and be prepared to take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, and of course, being Canadian, you know, we always hear that Gretzky quote and, and his success was not because he chased pucks, but instead anticipated where they would be. Um, and I think that that's the, the attitude that um, founders in, in Nova Scotia or, or, you know, Canada and abroad all need to share. Dennis, Thanks, jump Kim. in. All right, you bet. Um, you know, the slides that you saw early on there were, were you know, good examples of innovation. Some were innovative a long time ago and some are innovative today. Um, but the key to, to, to young people starting out as entrepreneurs is to try new and different things and to try lots of things. You know, uh, some things will work, some things won't. But, you know, you won't know if you don't try. And, and along the way, that's, one of, you know, one of the things we did. We've tried so, so many things. And, and you, you find some real gems in there. And so like the postcard example, which was very innovative at the time, uh, was, was kind of unheard of to use postcards in mail. It was always in an envelope for business. Um, you know, we, we were told we couldn't uh, break the cruise ship market and we used postcards over the, almost two years, one a month to this over and over with different messages. Uh, and we managed to, you know, crack an industry and, and, and believe it or not, gain almost 60 percent of an industry we were told we couldn't get by simply using postcards and i, I tell that story because neville loved that story and he, he had me tell it a few times a couple times actually face to face over the years but you know the the other two things that you saw there um send out cards uh there's, there's lots of online card systems but that that one you know i i sent Ken, uh, Lori a card that that she'll get uh, actually today or tomorrow I, I sent it a week ago from my iPhone and with my own handwriting uh, because my handwriting is in the system and it's customized with Neville's uh, uh, great face and, uh, you know, and, and a really nice message. And, and uh, the, the other one was uh, you can print a message on a, on a Guinness beer. And so you saw that I printed Neville's face on a Guinness beer at the old triangle. Uh, you can do so many fun and unique things as a way to connect and be innovative. And even though Neville wasn't a techie guy, Boy, was he innovative. Cool. Dennis, I'm going to ask you to keep going because you alluded to the face-to-face -face conference there. And I, I want to ask a little bit more about what that was, you know, how important was it to you as a younger entrepreneur? And t Tom, I'll ask you to jump in when Dennis is done too to get your thoughts. Sure, Kim. Thanks. Um, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, when I think back on that, uh, I, I remember driving to PEI with Neville in the backseat, uh, Max Brennan, Neville, Gilfoy, and I. And we went over for a couple meetings on the island. And on the way back, Neville talked about this concept of a, a, a new conference called Face to Face, and where business people and entrepreneurs would connect with their ideas with great speakers and have some fun. And he said, What do you think? And I said, Yeah, no, no, not a very good idea. And, and he said, Why? And I said, Wow, Neville, I said, there's so many conferences out there today. And I said, There's, there's just too many conferences. And, there's just so much time that everyone has. Of course, I had a young family and a growing business. And, you know, <laughs> thank God Neville didn't let, listen to me. He went for it and, my, and he wouldn't take no for an answer. He made sure that I was at every face-to-face, -face, almost, almost every one. And when I went to that conference, I was, it was almost euphoria to me because it was so incredibly valuable. The connections I made with other entrepreneurs, but, you know, with real, like some of the top people in business in Atlanta, Canada, it was, I could never get that otherwise. And, and, you know, one of the biggest deals I ever did came out of going to face to face. And so it was just, uh, I, I, I so miss it. I like I miss Neville. And I, I really hope that someday, somehow, someone will bring back Neville's face to face again. Yeah, we're all desperate for that, aren't we, Dennis? <laughs> Tom, yeah. jump in. I think it's ironic today to be called the face to face conference with us all on uh, Zoom here. But one of the things for me, I guess, and I wrote a note down, I was in my second year of business when I went to the conference and I said it was a golden opportunity as a young entrepreneur to meet very successful business leaders that you would never have the opportunity to cross paths with and you'd meet them casually with drinks 
and and learn. And so it, it was for those on the call that don't know, it was basically a gather, a business gathering for entrepreneurs with some formality, but it was very, very casual. And I can tell you uh, the nights were late. So we, um, we literally had fun. And I think that's where I met Dennis and a lot of other friends that had been business associates and good friends with me for a long, long time. So we, number one, we missed Neville, but number two, we missed the conference for sure. It, uh, it added real value. So Dennis and Tom, you've talked a bit about being young entrepreneurs and, and what sort of helped in your path to the success you've had now. Maybe I can ask Matt and Julia to sort of reflect on what we think, you know, what advice would you give young entrepreneurs that are starting out in this challenging era? Yeah, so so I can start, uh, and I, I guess I'll start by mentioning something Julia stated earlier, and, and it's that um, that attitude of being bold. I, I think significant at, at this time, right right now, the chaos and on and uncertainty that we see, um, I, I think is a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs if they are bold, if they are, um, you know, leading with an attitude of disruption. Um, you know, we're seeing significant retirements. Uh, you know, the timelines have expedited opportunities for young people to purchase businesses and and just add a layer of innovation into an, an, into a business that uh, maybe has, has been traditional for a little bit too long is significant um, and, and recognize that we're probably not going to go back to a, a you know the old ways that we hear the new normal every single day um, so so let's think about what you know what does 2021 2025 look like um, you know, and find a great mentor like uh, Neville, if you can, maybe, you know, maybe not shoot that high. I think it's a, a target, <laughs> puts a lot of pressure on people, but I, I think strong mentors is extremely important. Uh, and, and yeah, just being bold. Yeah, I, I think, Kim, what I would add to that is, is, is that it's hard. You know, being an entrepreneur is not an easy road to take. Being an innovative entrepreneur means that there's this added element of, of pace. You have to move quickly. And I think one of the things that comes with that is, is a pressure um, to feel like you have to be rushing through things. And, and that can be at the expense of really being in the moment in terms of your conversations with people, in terms of building those relationships. And, and what I would recommend to young entrepreneurs coming up is to not feel so rushed to just put one foot in front of the other and understand that the attention that you're giving the moment or the conversation or the action that you're doing is, is really gonna be compounded over time if you can give it that, that focus. Mm -hmm. And I've missed so many moments because I've been rushing too quickly. And, and so that, I think that would be my main piece of advice. Oh, that's great advice, Julia. Tom or Dennis, do you wanna jump in on this? Um. Julia, just to your comment, I, I guess mirroring it almost, uh, the one comment I say for people starting out is do your homework, get your research done. It's so, I don't wanna say easy today, but there's lots of op opportunity to become entrepreneurs today, which is great. But before you jump in, um, do your homework on what you're gonna get into, make sure there's a market for it, study it as hard as you can. And I think the second thing I would say with so much talk about mental health, um, if you can't or if you have challenges with stress think really hard because it's not easy and it's a high high stress job and so I, I put that out there just as a cautious reminder for folks that uh, it's stressful so if you can manage strengths go for it if not you really want to think hard about it Dennis you know my advice would be you know when you're feeling down or lonely as an entrepreneur because it, it, it's extremely rewarding but, but you don't get to the rewarding without some lonely times um and when you're feeling down and lonely as an entrepreneur do not listen to yourself because your inner voice can often talk you out of some great ideas or talk you down about you know what you can or can't do um, and so you know i like to say speak to yourself or speak to others when you're feeling down to to get that uh, energy and power to to make sure you don't talk yourself out of good ideas or good direction. Um, you know, I, I literally talked myself out of tilted tour guides. I thought, nah, it must not be a good idea because if it was, someone would have done it by now. It was the 80s. All the good ideas were good, <laughs> or so I thought. You know, so 
as strange as it sounds, speak to yourself. And like sometimes if you ever see me driving down the road, sometimes I'll be singing, but sometimes I am just speaking to myself and I'm talking to myself like a positive coach saying, Campbell, you can do it. And crazy as that sounds, but you have to talk to you, speak to yourself. So let me ask Julia, you said something interesting in your introduction when you talked a bit about coming to the region to pursue excellence. And and I think that's a great narrative and I want to hang on to that and have us think a bit more about that because you know, one of the things that, that culturally sometimes that frustrates me about about the Atlantic region is, you know, a kind of apprehension about being great or about sort of singing some of the fabulous things of the region. So can I ask anyone who wants to jump in to talk a little bit about um, you know, why entrepreneurship matters in the Atlantic region? What is it, what are entrepreneurs bringing to the region? Sort of talk a little bit, connect a little bit the story you've been threading out about the importance of entrepreneurial thinking, entrepreneurship innovation and, and, and root it in, I guess, the Atlantic region conversation. I can, I'll take it quickly, <laughs> um, just because I, I started that. Um, I was shocked that there was any attitude that we weren't the best in the world when I came because I came because I was told Actually, I was told Dartmouth, Neville Dartmouth, <laughs> was the place to be if you want to be the best in the world. And so when I understood later that there was a bit of a culture of maybe not feeling like we were the best in the world, I was just shocked. And I've seen it so many times in so many industries here that we really do kind of, we punch above our weight and and we have to be so proud of that. I Getting ready for this talk, I was watching some YouTubes of Neville speaking at conferences down in Bangor, Maine, and and uh, he was unapologetic. Like it was beautiful to watch that passion about this place and about what was happening. And Tom, he had done his homework. He knew what mm -hmm. everyone had done <laughs> with specificity, um, and he could tell those stories so beautifully. And and I think we should all be doing that. We all need to do that um, for one another because there's so many amazing things happening here. Dennis, do you want to jump in? Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, you know, um, Neville, uh, as, as Julia said, Neville taught us so well um, ab about how to think of Atlantic Canada. Um, you know, he, some of you would remember he talked about Atlantica and us all becoming one and being so much more powerful. And I, I truly believe someday, may, maybe not in our lifetime, but someday it will happen. It should happen. But you know what? small business and entrepreneurship, it's the lifeblood of Atlantic Canada and our economy and that's our communities. And that's why it's so important that each one of us who are entrepreneurs, you know, just go for it and make it happen and do it with that positive attitude that we are the best in the world because we are. Well, we're gonna take a couple questions from the audience, but before I do that, let me see if either Matthew or Tom wants to jump in on this. Sure, sure. I, I, you know, it's a, it's a tough one to not want to uh, make a comment on. I, I absolutely agree that, um, you know, Nova Scotia is the best province. I, I grew up in Cape Breton, um, you know, and, and I think one of the things for me was feelings of, of needing to, you know, step away for bigger opportunities. So, so all every time that I see, you know, significant opportunities here in the province, it's extremely motivating to know that, you know, I can say. Um, you know, peers can stay and, and even future children, future generations are, are supported here as well. Great. Uh, just, Let me, oh, go ahead, Tom, sorry. No, I'll just chime in for you there, uh, Kim. I guess for me, one of the things that was coming from Glace Bay, I think the idea of success to me in Glace Bay was different the further in other places as I got the benefit of traveling. And I just think for new entrepreneurs, um, it doesn't matter if you're in LA or if you're in New York or Toronto or Alberta, um, that can do attitude just, it not only has to exist, but it's real. And, uh, I just think you need to own it. Don't let that be a barrier. It's not, um, you can grow Like you said, we worked in Brazil, Kazakhstan, Russia, all over the world. And it started right here in Halifax. Okay. I'm going to turn to a uh, question from the audience. Maybe you can, oh, there we go. Look at that. Uh, what's a mistake you made or an unexpected challenge you encountered as an entrepreneur and how did you overcome it? So thanks, Beatrice. Um, let me, uh, let me, I'm always reluctant to put someone on the spot. You know what I mean? Especially on an unexpected challenge. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> 
Who can I who can I impose on on this one first? Maybe I'll put you on the spot, Dennis. Go for it. Well, I, I tell this one because this is one that Neville would often ask me to tell if we were out having a couple of drinks with with new people that hadn't heard it. But he, he'd say, Dennis, t tell the story of when you found out that you were actually a pimp. And I won't go into great detail about that. It wasn't very fun at the time, but after the fact, it, it was funny in the fact. I inadvertently hired a prostitute to work for us as a tour guide. And and Neville thought that was the funniest story I ever heard. And so he said, technically, Campbell, you are a pin. <laughs> it was a challenge, but we overcame it. It wasn't fun at the time when I realized what had happened, but you get, you get over it. Uh, Dennis, I'm not going to be able to top that one, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't mind jumping in. Uh, I would say one of the biggest ones for me is most of the businesses I get into, I get into with partners. And I think it's knowing expectations up front for what you're bringing to the table and what your partner brings to the table. And I think writing them down so that two years from now, whether the business is up or down, you can sit down and say, okay, I'm here to support, but that falls under your, your hat. So for startups, I'd really say line out who's responsible for what. Uh, one of the comments in our office is, you know, you want one throat to choke. And I know it sounds aggressive, but it, there's a there's a lot to be said in it. Just just from a mom's perspective, I made the mistake of of letting guilt drive me for too long. I'm I'm a mom of four. Um, I've been an entrepreneur since since my kids were very little, and for a long time, I felt very guilty about dividing time. And when I was able to get over that hurdle everything became better. So just, you know, not wasting the energy on those types of emotions that are just so non-productive is something that I've learned. Matthew, do you want in on this one? You've never made a mistake. It's possible. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll go back to, uh, I think, a, a comment Tom made uh, on, on the preparation. I, I've certainly made my uh, share of mistakes in, in business as well as uh, just general work and, and stretching myself. Uh, but I, I think that research and preparation, um, you know, I, I've definitely had situations where I've seen, you know, a couple folks, um, you know, tackle, tackle a certain type of business and think that, you know, if they're doing well, then there must be a good market and, and I can do well. Um, but the, the adequate research was certainly not there. So I've, uh, I've felt that sting a couple times for sure. Um, and uh, so I, I do what I can now to kind of uh, encourage young entrepreneurs, especially to, to do just that. And, you know, we do have a culture of, you know, fail fast and make mistakes, but, it, it, you know, let's try to minimize them as much as we possibly can. <laughs> All right, let's take another question from the audience. Here's a question from Ken. How do you provide conditions for young innovators, leaders to succeed in your area of business, whether it's internships or actually onboarding of new employees? What do you do to ensure the initial experience is motivating? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question, Ken. Thank you. I, I, I'll let you jump in there if you want. I sure. think that's, that's a great question is right. And I think as entrepreneurs, we can do a little bit more work on, on the front end of that challenge. I think, you know, lining the right people up with the company and making sure values and culture are all in line is is a thing to do but that's when i'd suggest that we probably need to communicate more with the uh young innovators and and get their inputs on what they want to see at our offices one of the things we've learned a lot is just on work-life balance and i think uh for us and uh, i'm officially now an older entrepreneur um it's been it's been really educational to understand that there's there's new um, requirements for the person that's coming in and we better understand it or they're not going to be with us. So we've done a lot of stuff there. Mm. Yeah, we, we've we've had so many amazing co-op students um, from Dow. Um, nice. Thank in. you for the connection um, there at the end, Julia. <laughs> the most amazing computer science co-ops you're going to get. Um, so I think one of the things that we focused on in our company in terms of culture, Tom, is is high performance. So we we bring in people who are high performance players who we see that out of the you know we see that out of the gate in them. But along with that comes trust. And when I when I talk to a new employee who joins our team, and I talk to every single one, every single co-op, 
I let them know that they're coming in with our full trust. They don't have to build it. They have it completely and we wouldn't have hired them otherwise. And that gives them a, a confidence to be able to have the autonomy to bring in new ideas, which it's just incredible. The co-ops we've had have just been such great high performers and we've had so much from them. So I think building that that sense in them that they can take on uh, really exciting opportunities is, is so important. Matthew or Dennis, either of you went in on that? Matthew, go ahead. Okay, uh, sure. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll say for young entrepreneurs, we um, one of the one of the composite group uh, entities that we have at BBI is called Businesses Jam, and and it's uh, it's basically a platform for young entrepreneurs and people who are interested in entrepreneurship to to really explore it as a career opportunity, build networks, um, and, and just learn some of the the hard skills that are required for entrepreneurship. Um, you know, but it's it's worked very well because it it also helps us recognize uh, some of the really interesting ideas and attitudes of of youth who are looking towards entrepreneurship that we can use to support our, our larger um, you know entrepreneurial client clients and kind of match them in entrepreneurs as well as some of the quote unquote older entrepreneurs uh, <laughs> because both groups of course have, have a lot to offer. Um, you know, so I, so I think anytime we can create um, intentional spaces to allow people to explore entrepreneurship, uh, you know, we benefit, we've, we've just launched a project with Volta um, and, and the focus in that project was on LGBTQ um, black and indigenous founders and the response has been overwhelming you know and, and it just goes to show that you know there's such an interest in having that space and having that safe uh, place to really explore that as an opportunity so the more we can do that I, I think it will be much better off uh, I'm seeing huge improvements in the province but but we certainly can't stop here awesome thanks Matthew We've got we've got time maybe for another question from the audience, Dennis. While they put it up, do you want to weigh in on that last one? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, uh, we we have a very uh, entrepreneurial culture internally, and when we onboard uh, co-op students, we 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 explain to them that that's an important part of our culture. And we've had many co-op students, many great Dal co-op students as well, that that actually. Um, have ended up becoming long-time employees. Uh, we pride ourselves on a great corporate culture, but we've, being entrepreneurial, we, we encourage them that they want to go out and become an entrepreneur. We'll help them do that, and, and that's happened. We've had several uh, co-op students uh, become entrepreneurs. They get excited about it, and they become great uh, partners and, and suppliers of ours over the years. And it's really neat to see that uh, microcosm happen and, and to you know be part of fostering these young entrepreneurs become really uh, experienced entrepreneurs. Yeah. All right, here's a question from Aftab. As entrepreneurs, when do you make the call to go to the overseas market? It might look good, but there's major liability issues. I mean, Tom, why don't I put this on you first since you've raised a few of them and, and, and then Julia, see if you have reflections and then, and then open it up to Dennis and Matthew if you feel like it. Sure, I can kind of bounce back to one of the questions too, which was about mistakes you made. Um, so I actually worked a fair bit overseas, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Doha and Russia, Cas Caspian Sea, mentioned Brazil and Mexico. And I think the first thing I would say is, is confirm the market is there. So make sure there's something you're providing that isn't already there. Because if there's someone locally doing it and they're doing a really good job, you might think it's a good idea, but it's a big investment. Um, that would be number one. Number two for me would be back to doing your homework. Understand the culture. Um, I think coming from Glacebam moving to Halifax, there was a culture change. Um, and so culture is real and you just have to respect it and understand how you fit in. Um, one of the things we missed on our research in Brazil was corruption. And when we were down there, it was, it was rampant everywhere. So we were through the Canadian consulate, we were arrived with products in Brazil and had to figure out as a Canadian from Nova Scotia, what do I do with corruption in a country as big as Brazil? So uh, if I'd known that now, I definitely wouldn't have went. And uh, 
So it was five years in Brazil. We didn't make money at the end of it. And so looking back, if like I said, really do your homework on the markets. Thanks, Tom. Julia? I, I agree with everything Tom said. Uh, I might just add one of the best pieces of advice I was given just about market and go to market. Um, and this, this applies to all markets, not just overseas markets, but I think you have to really be deliberate about looking for where the pull is. So pushing is never as successful as feeling the pull from the market. So, and that's that's something that we've we've done is we've looked at where we have concentrated uh, interest in what we're doing and and we've focused on there very, very deliberately and with discipline um, rather than trying to just make a market. Um, and I think that's just an important piece of advice kind of more generally speaking. It just makes life a lot easier. I know we've got another question from the audience queued up. So maybe I'll ask that we shift to it and I'm gonna start by putting, yeah, there we go, perfect. I'm gonna start by putting both Matthew and Dennis on the spot on this one. So what silver linings have each of you discovered from the pandemic? Thanks for the question, Eric. Matthew, you wanna go first? Sure. Uh, so some, something that uh, that I already mentioned that I, I think is the big one is the the huge opportunities that that come as a result of uh, you know chaos and uncertainty. I guess we can say. Uh, I, I think a lot of businesses in the province, um, you know, the founders were nearing retirement. Um, you, you know, the need to put significant uh, innovation and, and make significant changes to their business model. I, I really don't think the the need or not that the need wasn't there, but I don't think, um, you know, to Julia's point, the pull to make that change was there. Um, but since this has happened, I think, you know, it's really opened the eyes of a lot of founders, a lot of organizations, um, you know, even for very simple technological changes. And, you know, it's been extremely eye opening in terms of what what the market is looking for, what do, what is consumer behavior doing these days? Uh, so I think for founders, the opportunities to say purchase businesses, um, you know, at, at really really um, you know great prices and and really great returns if they have the ability to manage um, and inject that level of innovation into the business. Um, I, I think that opportunity is significant. So I'm going to go out on a limb here uh, in, in I'm going to channel my inner Neville because Neville was very good at going out on a limb and, and sharing like nobody would share. Um, the silver lining of the pandemic has been very profound for me. Um, in the springtime, uh, April, May last year, when the world was shut down and we had no uh, visibility on vaccines or what the future held, I've never been so stressed or had so many sleepless nights in my life. And uh, although our lenders were fantastic and they said, Dennis, relax, we're gonna be, stand by you. You've got a good company with a good strong balance sheet. I literally you know, realized that our company, which I had built my entire life, went from being very valuable to worthless. And you know, I said to my wife, I said, you know, I think it's time that we sell our house. And she said, I don't wanna sell our house. And I said, I'm sorry, you make 99% of the decisions. But I said, this is not a discussion or a negotiation. I said, we have to, I said, because if this thing goes down, because this we have no idea how long this is going to go on. If this goes down, it'll be like a house of cards. And I said, and you and I will be out on the street. And I said, I'm just so thankful that our kids are, are now in the early 20s and they don't depend on us. But I said, we have to do something. Because I said, my name is tied to many millions of dollars and our company is worthless. And, and you know, the incredible thing, our, our bankers were true to the word. We, we've been able to, with a lot of effort, secure the company for the long term and we're, we're now ready and, and and but we moved and we moved into an apartment i've never lived in an apartment my entire life and i've realized i love apartment living there's, 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 there's no stress no hassle and I'm, I'm i'm right by murphy so i can you know get that work-life balance and anyway it's just incredible to to see what as as matthew said you know what uh, um, out of this pandemo uh, pandemonium what good things can come from it. And and uh, I could go on and on at, at nauseum, but uh, I, I asked my wife a couple weeks ago, I said, if you could go back and change it, put ourselves back in our family home, would you? And she said, absolutely not. And I would agree. Thanks. So let me, let me turn to the last question, which is um, what's the most important lesson that you've learned from your journey? 
And um, I'll ask you to use this as a chance to sort of have any final reflections you want to have on this fabulous panel. And then we'll wrap up this part of the panel and there'll be a couple of more things to wrap up the rest of the session. So, so Julia, why don't I ask you to step in first? Yeah, there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it and I'm going to say two things. Um, the first will be uh, to co Tom's comment earlier, just about kind of the stress and mental health of it all, to be able to learn how to manage the highs and lows to be able to keep some some kind of level of consistent um, stress, because it's not so bad, um, but also health at the same time. That's been one of the things that I think has been the most important lesson and one that I'm glad I've learned. Uh, but the other, and this relates to Neville directly, is the, the power of storytelling. And the if you can tell your own story in a way that you are bold and passionate, um, it can be so incredible. and. I, you know, one of the things I just wish I had the opportunity to thank Neville. I just remember as an early entrepreneur in my early 20s, no connections, nothing to give Neville. You know, I had nothing valuable to offer him. He would just stop into my office, this little dingy office in Bears Lake, <laughs> and he would talk to me. And I felt so lucky. Like, I felt like, oh my gosh, he sees my potential. And he would really listen to my story. And sometimes he'd even promote my story. And and what I realized when I was doing kind of my watching those YouTube videos and reading the articles before this talk was that he did that for everyone. <laughs> like he made everybody feel so special because he really was interested and he really listened to the stories and he took those in and, and then he promoted those stories. And, and I, I just am so grateful because without those hand, you know, the hand up that you get and you get it here in Atlantic Canada, I think more than anywhere else in the world, we just, I just never would have been able to see the success. So, yeah, so thank you, Neville. Awesome, thank you, Julia. Tom, why don't you jump in? Um, I think for me, the biggest lesson learned over the pandemic, uh, it's not necessarily business related because I think we've seen a lot of businesses affected differently, um, but it was actually more tourism related and I didn't, I saw parts of Eastern Canada I've never been to and literally I've had the opportunity to go to spots that I probably, as you get to travel more, uh, you wouldn't even have considered. So that would probably be my silver lining. Um, with respect to um, the business side of things, I just think it's important for me, we've never had to lay off people, which I'm really, really proud to say. And I think when I take on the ownership of being an entrepreneur, I feel responsible for the families that you're feeding. And so with all of the doom and gloom that's come, that hits pretty hard and how you manage back to the stress thing. Some of those things when you're home at night and you have food in front of you, um, you know, you affect a lot of lives for this and, uh, and culture and everything. So just take, take it for real. It's, it's the real deal. Thanks, Tom. Matthew. Yeah, for, for me, it's the uh, the importance of strong support systems. Um, I've found, you know, my ability to kind of build that support system, whether it comes to, you know, mental health or, or mentorship. There's there's so many, I guess, areas of your life that, that having strong supports is important. So so you do feel a bit more confident taking that entrepreneurial leap. Um, you know, and giving yourself that opportunity to, you know, to learn and, and figure things out without, um, you know, significant worries. So that's been important for me, whether I've, you know, launched um, a, a little business or whether I've, you know, moved uh, from government to private or, or to not for profit. Um, each one of those things, of course, has its own risks. Uh, but just knowing that I have that support system you know, I have that network that I can bounce ideas off of or bring unique challenges that I'm having to it has really helped me along the way. Uh, so so that's what I would say is a big one for me and would encourage others um, to constantly develop that support system. Dennis, we'll give you the, the last word of this part, at least, of today's session. Thanks so much. Um, you know, what I've learned is the absolute severe or significant importance of treating people well really really treating them well um and have fun along the way um but you know something again i'll go out on a limb here and say that when i went through that tough time in the early on in the pandemic when i thought everything was going to crash down around me um I, I experienced a mental pain that i've never experienced in my life before and i learned through that process that 
you know, to, to when you feel that, go get help. And, and I did. And my, my GP was able to give me a quick little uh, 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 test. And she told me that I was, for the first time in my life, I was diagnosed with uh, mild depression. And she said, you know, Dennis, it doesn't go from zero to 60 at once, but it can go quickly. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I got medication. It was a new medication that, uh, you know, was amazing. And within five days, I started to feel like my old self. And then, you know, six months later, I weaned myself off. And I, I know from that experience, and if that ever happens again, I, I will seek help right away. I won't wait too long. And I, I, I share that with all of you because, you know, it's as we all know, we need to talk about it, as, as Matthew said. And, and uh, you know, if others hear that story, maybe they'll, they'll go get help when they start to feel a pain they've never felt before. Dennis, what a great story, because I feel, I kind of almost feel like there's a Neville moment in there. I could sort of imagine, you know, connecting it with the story where he sat you down and said, like, what's going on, man? Like, let's, <laughs> let's work this out, you know? And so kind of taking seriously the problems as you find them and then, you know, not sort of hiding things or be shying away from actually confronting things directly and knowing that you can get through them. There, there's something really lovely about the stories that you've told about him that give us a bit of a feel of, of who he was as a person. So thank you. you um, so let me, I'm going to come back and thank the panel again in a minute. We're going to get a chance to come back and say goodbye to the audience, but we want to share two videos with you before we do that. Um, the first of them is a thank you message from one of two Neville Guilfoy bursary recipients, Van Warich, uh, uh, Chapanarak, I think, and and then we'll have a message from Jamie Guilfoy, and then we'll be returning uh, to say a final goodbye to everybody. So stick with us. We'll see you in a couple minutes. Hi, my name is Pamrit De Chapinarak. I'm currently a second year management student at Dalhousie University. I'm pursuing two majors right now. The first one is entrepreneurship and innovation. The second one is the economics. With this financial support, I think it's very helpful to me and my family. Since uh, during this pandemic situation, my family have been through a lot of tough situation. So uh, with this financial support, uh, I can focus more on my study and like less of a uh, family financially. And lastly, I wake very grateful for like the financial support and I will keep up my good work for the rest of like the year at the LC. So, uh, thank you. That was great. So, <laughs> so what a heartfelt short short video so let me we're going to do one more i think before we come back to say a final goodbye let me let me turn it over to jamie hi i'm jamie gilfoy i'm the president of aquatex translation services and neville gilfoy's son on behalf of my entire family i'd like to thank everybody involved in making this amazing event a huge success Uh, It's really a true honor and a privilege uh, to see Neville's legacy preserved and carried on like this. Uh, Neville and I both graduated from the Dal Arts Program and probably spent a bit too much time goofing around in the sub during that time. Uh, I worked at Progress for many years before taking the leap to start my own business almost a decade ago. Uh, Neville mentored and inspired many people, myself included, Um, I'm quite sure I wouldn't have become an entrepreneur if it weren't for Neville. He loved Atlantic Canada and he really believed that it was possible to succeed and grow here in the region without having to leave. So I'm pretty sure I was supposed to talk about how much this event means to my family today. And uh, to be clear, it means more than I could possibly explain to all of us, really. It's huge. But in a classic Neville move, I'm going to go off program here today and instead tell you three lessons that I learned from Neville uh, in the many years I got to spend both living and working with him. So the first thing is that if you have a dream, you have to go after it. Um, Neville didn't have a business education. He didn't come from money. He didn't really even have any money. And if we're being honest, he didn't even do particularly well in school. But he had a dream. He was focused. He believed. Uh, Even when no one else believed in him, and even when all the odds were stacked against him, he just knew that this is what he had to do, and he kept pushing. And it wasn't just some big magical thing that happened overnight. It really, I think, boiled down to more constantly pushing, taking one step at a time, and just going forward. And really, he did big things, and he impacted many people's lives. 
and you can too, but you just have to go for it. Throw these papers away. Number two, you're going to get knocked down. Um, you're going to experience setback, loss, failure, defeat. But it doesn't really matter. It's all about how you get back up. And it's not to say that you have to feel good about it. Life is going to be very hard sometimes. And I think that all you can really do is try to come to grips with the situation, accept things, try to move forward. Ride the waves as they take you. Uh, at the end of it all, though, you have to pull yourself together. You've got to find it deep within yourself to get back up. Keep pushing. The only real defeat is staying knocked down. And this brings me to number three. And I think if I had any piece of advice to give to anybody, anywhere, for anything, is that life is very short. Uh, all the people and the things that you love and care about and maybe even take for granted are eventually going to go away. And as hard as it is to say, none of us are going to live forever. Now, this isn't a doom and gloom message. In fact, this is uh, inspiring to me. I think it's motivating to keep this in the back of your mind when you wake up because there's so much time and energy and emotion wasted on things that just don't matter in life. And if you can keep in mind that, you know, this is the time you've got, you may be able to better spend it. So make time for the people you care about. Do the things you love. Play the cards you've got, been dealt. Carry your head high. And make the most of this time that you have. Because we all only get so many days in life. And the big question is, what are you going to do with yours? On behalf of my entire family, thank you so much. Uh, this is just a tremendous honor. Uh, Neville would be ecstatic to see this happening. And I encourage you all to go do big things. Keep your head held up high and try and have some fun while you're doing it. Jamie, that was so great. Uh, I kind of feel, I don't even want to say goodbyes and thank yous at the end. I want to just leave it there. But um, let me let me say a few concluding things. So thanks to our amazing interpreter, Karina, and to our awesome backstage crew who have worked really hard to launch this inaugural Neville Guilfoy talk on the future of entrepreneurship and innovation. Thanks to everyone for sharing your memories of Neville in the chat. What a great, uh, we'll, have the, we'll have that captured and that will, that will give us something great to go back and revisit. As Don mentioned in his opening, this project has been <laughs> some time in the making. So we're so excited that we were able to get this launched and to spend some of this morning with you. You'll see a banner there at some point about the Neville Guilfoy Bursary and Entrepreneurship and Innovation Fund that's been established to provide financial support for Dalhousie business students studying entrepreneurship and innovation. And we're really excited to be the host of that and to be curating that part of his legacy. I'm really grateful to everyone on the panel for sharing your insights and your stories from the heart this morning. I think it made it a really special inaugural event. And I feel like this was such a wonderful opportunity for us to celebrate and remember Neville. And for some of us, Matthew and I in particular, to feel like we got to know him a little, which is a hard thing to do in an hour on a, on a Thursday morning. And so I'm really grateful for people for, for sharing with us that kind of texture of the man. I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. We're going to meet again next year. And so I'll look forward to round two when we're able to do that. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>